I'm with Atul Keshap, the president of the US-India Business Council, a former US diplomat who has served in some of the most interesting locations in the world, including Sri Lanka, and most recently right here in New Delhi, where he was charged affairs of the US Embassy in India. But today we're talking not just about the US-India relationship, but also about ferment in the world. The three-month-long invasion by Russia of Ukraine has triggered severe US sanctions. The Quad Summit, just only the second in-person summit, has just taken place in Tokyo between President Biden, the US President, Prime Minister Modi, and the Prime Ministers of Japan and Australia. But before I come to all these questions, let me welcome Ambassador Keshap to the print. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you very much, Jyoti. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. My first question to you is about the US-India relationship. And I will quote to you a, um, something that Robert Blackwell, your predecessor he right here in Delhi, said 20 long years ago, admittedly, where he said the US-India uh, relation, or the US, the Indian economy is like a flat chapati. It refuses to rise <laughs> like a puri. So you tell me, chapati or puri? I would say that the 75-story skyscrapers of Lower Perel, which are full of American banks, American data companies, digital economy companies, prove that the Indian economy is rising like a puri. Oh, good. So uh, apart from the fact that you're proving Ambassador Blackwell wrong, and, I'm, and I hope he's watching <laughs> this. I, I hope, well, I'm glad, but I hope he's going to watch this interview too. So rising like a Puri, huh. not just because you're president of the U.S. India Business Council, but having said that, both India and the U.S. are not comfortable about a trade agreement. Both um, protagonists have met Commerce Minister Piyush Goel, as well as your tra trade representative, Catherine Tai, mm. but no tr free trade agreement. Well, look, I mean, ours are two very large, diverse, pluralistic, open free societies. They're both democracies. They both have parliaments and disaggregation of power. And so in our society, uh, frankly, it's very tough politically to push through trade agreements right now. And I think the government recognizes it. So then what has happened, which is really good news, and it's frankly something I want to take a minute or two to talk about, is that as of Monday in Tokyo, the United States and India are now, for the first time in my professional career, together in not only a strategic construct, but an economic construct. Now, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the Indo-Pacific Economic mm. Forum. But I want to come back to the India-US free trade agreement that everybody talks about, has been talking about for the longest time. Why isn't it happening? Well, look, nations have to figure things out that are politically feasible. and. It is very tough to push through free trade, free trade agreements in the current era. In my country, on the right and the left, there are some very strong voices against uh, recent free trade agreements. So I think what you have to recognize is there, there is political reality. Now, look at what India is doing. So India they don't is, want, so the Americans don't want a free trade agreement? No, I wouldn't say that. You're, <laughs> you're putting words in my mouth, okay. or you're putting words in America's mouth. I think there's a desire to see uh, greater trade between the United States and India on the part of both companies and on the part of governments on both sides. It is the getting there that is very challenging. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the efforts between both governments, they're very encouraging right now. There's a lot of good discussion going on. There was a very good trade policy forum in Washington last year. And I see signs of hope. And you have to recognize the realities of the politics in both countries. Which is what? Well, in the U.S., there's all kinds of issues. So when there is a moment of possibility, things will move forward. But there is a trajectory that is very important. Look at trade volumes between the U.S. and India. When I first came here, they were very, very low. Uh, back in the 70s, it was almost negligible. And then when I came here as a diplomat for the first time, it was around 20, 30 billion. We're at 170 billion today in a relatively short it's period of time. It's 113 billion where uh, you know goods are concerned. Perhaps right. if you add services, add services. That's another right. 50 billion. But that sort of potential. It's a well. It's a fair point, uh, Ambassador Keshap. I'm not telling. I'm not sort of trying to say that you're responsible for the fact that trade is so bad or you know services are not taking off in the this in the momentum they should be. But the question is, what do you think are the issues both in India and in the U.S. You know, the, the two 
uh, protagonists, both Prime Minister Modi and President Biden, say that they want better relations, but it's rhetoric. A lot of it is just rhetoric. Jyoti, I don't think I take that negative frame. I actually take a very optimistic and ambitious frame. Think about the places I've been on this trip. Mm -hmm. uh, Palo Alto, where when you go out in the town square at six o'clock at night to have a coffee, half the people you see are Indian or Indian American. Come to Bangalore and see how over a million people in Bangalore are employed by American companies at the top end of innovation and design. Go to Lower Perel, Mumbai. Go to BKC. Go to Gurgaon. Go to Salt Lake in Calcutta. There is so much going on between our two economies at the highest level of innovation and design. India has amazing scalable capabilities in terms of human talent and very well-trained, well-educated human talent. American companies know this. Our trade and business and investment relationship is turning into a relationship where we are creating trusted networks between our two countries in communications, in privacy, right. in data. So. I wouldn't take the negative frame and say we haven't done enough. I would say our companies, Indian and American, are actually doing a tremendous amount and government can create the enabling environment, which right. it is doing. So I suppose it's the glass half full, half empty uh, uh, you know, story. But you've met here in Delhi, uh, not just on this visit, but also in previous visits, perhaps you know, the government of, uh, or the cabinet at least of Prime Minister Modi, perhaps for the exception of the Prime Minister himself. So tell me, what is the sense you get from your meetings here, right from the external affairs minister, Jay Shankar, as well as Mr. Ashwini Veshno, uh, the railways and IT minister? What's your sense of what, what are they saying about the India-US relationship? I'm hearing very positive signs, very, uh, a very good sense of optimism about what our high trust societies can achieve together. If you look at our but convergence like, uh, give me, in the- Give me an example. Well, safe and resilient and secure supply chains. That's one great example. In, in everything that we manufacture and everything that we use. If we have secure and resilient supply chains, we won't be as exposed to the kinds of disruptions that we saw during the pandemic. Look at our cooperation on vaccines. Look at our cooperation on uh, you know, designing the standards of the digital economy of the 21st century to ensure the rights and privacy and freedom of the individual. That kind of high trust confidence between America and India is going to shape the entire world. Give me an example. Right now it's talk. I, I mean, I'm sure it could lead to something that's you know, fascinating. But give me a concrete example of something that could happen. Look, it's not talk. Um, the U.S.-India digital economy in uh, every year is about $100 billion. If you look at the top 10 digital economy companies, they're American and Indian. Think about everything you used electronically during the pandemic, every movie you downloaded, every business uh, phone call or video call you did on your laptop. That was an American and Indian backbone that made it happen. And there are people in Bangalore and in Silicon Valley who made sure that worked through the entire pandemic. But what I'm hearing is that the data localization problem is, is a big negative, a, a big impediment in the digital economy promise that both of you, but both countries want to push through. So this is where I would say we actually have developed a lot of trust and a lot of good communication. Okay. Uh, US IBC has 200 member companies, Indian and American, at the very highest levels of technical achievement and accomplishment. All of them largely are data companies. And so what I, my job and the job of my team in Delhi and in Washington is to accumulate those sentiments coming from Indian and American companies and offer constructive feedback and input to the two governments. USIBC is the child of both governments. We are part of the US Chamber of Commerce. We exist in a privileged and unique, unique role in advising the governments constructively, privately, on ways to increase the prosperity and happiness of both of our peoples. I will tell you that discussions with the Indian government and the American government on these issues have been very constructive, mutually respectful, focused on the details, and focused on how high trust societies can work together. And this is since the pandemic? Yep, since the pandemic. Okay. And there's actually been, I think, an intensification after the pandemic to do even more to ensure that our two systems are harmonized because the pandemic has been a very severe master. It has taught us very tough lessons. Like what? High trust societies 
Yeah. Well, no, what does that mean? What is? What do you mean when you? Say I trust that? you. You trust me. No, right now I'm not here to. Be we can do the. Anybody. We can do the. You're talking about the two governments. <laughs> yes. Between the two governments, yes. your country and mine. Yes. You know, it seems to me that not enough people are meeting each other. They meet at the Quad, except for the perhaps for the exception of. Uh, our two external affairs ministers, yours and mine, and Mr. Jay no, Shankar no, 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 no. There's discussions going on all the time. Okay. There are discussions on all kinds of sensitive issues and all kinds of important issues w that are marked by trust and confidence and a constructive perspective about how our trusted ecosystem can be the prevailing ecosystem for humanity because it will empower people in the 21st century. Getting those standards right is really critical. So there's ongoing cooperation. I mean, when I was chargé here, I looked at all of the areas of cooperation. But you haven't given me one example Dialogue so is excellent. We can just start reeling them off. Okay. Um, maritime domain awareness, something as humble as illegal and unregulated fishing. Uh, you know, we can talk about climate and environmental uh, uh, sustainability. We can talk about India's energy transition plan. How about our intelligence cooperation, our law enforcement cooperation, counterterrorism cooperation? The list goes on and on and on. Space cooperation. And tell me something, Ambassador Keshav. You've been a diplomat for, you know, a large part of your life. Do you feel in this new role that this, these high trust societies that you talk about, both India and the US, that perhaps this has be, that the situation has improved since the pandemic. And, uh, and of course, the big dragon in the room is China. Is it because of that? We've been building our relationship in earnest since probably about the year 2000. So there's 22 years of sincere effort on both sides and it's been bipartisan uh, in the elites of both societies. Right. And it's been backed by millions of well-thinking and well-minded people. And we have systematically worked through problem after problem after problem with trust and confidence in each other. And I am convinced that we're going to keep doing that, that we are now quad partners. We are part of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. There is a tremendous amount that we've already done together, development cooperation in third countries. We do all kinds of things like pandemic vaccine distribution. But is China the dragon in the room? The Chinese make their own choices in life, and we will make our choices. We are the four great democracies of the Indo-Pacific. We have far more in common than we have apart. Two play cricket, two play baseball. We have found a perfect concert and convergence of values and outlook, and it is positive, it is ambitious, it is entrepreneurial, it is for the good of our citizens, it's for the good you know, the of the entire Indo-Pacific. But it seems to me that the penny seems to have dropped only very recently. It's not as if the Chinese haven't been around. And in fact, US-China trade is five times over $650 billion than US-India trade. Of course, it's growing, but US-India trade is about $113 billion as of last year. True. So, you know, the, it's completely unequal. There's no question about it. So while you talk about democracies coming together in a quad, there is China in the, in the room. You know, whatever animal you prefer, elephant, dragon, it doesn't really matter. But th the fact is that, that there is so much rhetoric around the quad that it doesn't really make sense to challenge China. Well, those are your words, not mine. My, view, you agree with me? my view is that we should ensure that the democratic nations of the Indo-Pacific work well together and create ecosystems of trust that are good for everybody. And th this is where there may be some competing views about the future of humanity. I will tell you, I will always bet, always bet, on American and Indian and Japanese and Australian values. And I think our nations are going in that direction because we realize... Forgive me for interrupting you, but for the last few years, President Trump, who began, I, I think he who set, the, who set the ball in motion regarding China when the U.S.-China trade war began. But four years down the line, the U.S.-China trade war has no winners. In fact, the Americans are getting impacted. And I'll tell you what my concern is, is that you're going to, you're not dropping the ball with China. So a lot of this is rhetoric. So the U.S.-India relationship is going to be affected by the U.S.-China continuing trade uh, ties. Well, Jyoti, I don't want to make news on the show about things that I know. Why not? But the point is that, <laughs> but the point is that a lot of our companies are increasingly looking to each other for investment and employment okay. and design and innovation because we are again in those high trust societies. Mm -hmm. American investment in India is a catalyst for India becoming 
in a far more rapid time frame, a $10 trillion economy. You will no doubt make it on your own, at your own pace, in any way that you see fit. It, it's a sovereign country. I think American investment makes that happen faster. And it, it ensures fantastic opportunities for Indian people. It ensures prosperity for India. So China will do whatever China does. We will do what we do. And so we will do it for US our own well-being. So why are US, US companies leaving India in that case? Leaving India? Yes. Why are you <coughs> withdrawing from which India? Which countries, which companies are leaving India? You know, the market especially is, you know, the market is, 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 is in ferment because of the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, energy prices going through the roof. But even otherwise, besides that, I think the Indian economy, a lot of uh, policy analysts believe, hasn't been able to get its act together and a lot of people are leaving. So I'm not sure about that because I'm not hearing that people are leaving. India's is a vast uh, market. There are 1.4 billion Indians. The demographics of this country are amazing. The human talent skills here are really found nowhere else on, in the world. And if you're a company that needs to be in the advanced, most innovative, data-intensive parts of the economy, you have to have an India angle. I would also say on uh, the point that you've made that there's actually been a vast amount of movement in India in the past, say, seven or eight or 10 years. Look at things as modest as toilets, drinking water, tap water in every house, roads, airports. You know, I arrive in these airports and I think, wow, this is the India of my dreams. I mean, I couldn't have imagined that Santa Cruz Airport of 1975 would now be Chhatrapati Shivaji of 2022. So certainly not the India of your childhood. And, and you know, India, Vast transformation. Of course, huge transformations. And India is on the move. I see, look, I go into government ministries and uh, I was in five different ones today. I met five different ministers and I, think about the times I've been into ministries in the past, and I went into one today that is festooned with vision documents of what the Indian government is trying to achieve for its people and for its society. It's a total change in attitude. It's the politics of prosperity. So who have you met today? Well, I met Minister Jai Shankar, a dear friend and respected and wise guru on U.S.-India relations. Uh, I met Minister Vaishnav. I met Ms. Minister Dharmendra Pradhan. I met Minister Yadav, I met Minister Chandrasekhar, and I have more meetings tomorrow. Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Yes. Okay, so to come back to the US-China question, and you know, I know I um, am sort of persisting with it, but you know, I, I hope you will be tolerant of that. And you've worked in China a lot when you were a US diplomat, so I think you know both sides of the coin. I think like, my question is that the US that the US and China trade relation, they're not going to be able to disengage with each other anytime soon. Mm. Similarly, Japan and China. Mm. Similarly, Australia and China. Mm. So what's the big concern about China? China has changed. I remember a China when I was APEC envoy where you could have a tea or a coffee uh, in the lounge of the hotel and have a discussion with Chinese people. You could invite them for a banquet at a restaurant and have a very free form discussion. I remember a China where you had fairly vigorous uh, public debates on Sina Weibo and, and uh, WeChat about issues of corruption or transparency. Uh, I remember a China that was engaging with the world. Now you have a China that is closing down. You know, if you look at COVID zero in China, uh, it's been very tough on the Chinese people. So there's been something that's happened in China in the last 10 years that is fundamental and we all have to recognize it and we all have to- What do you think has happened? Well, I think you've got a different tack in terms of how they view the world and how they view their attitude toward the world. But again, I'm not responsible for China anymore. I'm responsible for U.S.-India. My dharma is to make sure U.S.-India relations rise through the entire century to become the single most consequential bilateral relationship of any two countries on Earth. And if it happens, it'll be good for India, it'll be good for America, it'll be good for our 1.7 million billion democracy-loving people, but, it'll be good for everybody. But my question is that I'm not sure that the, that the U.S. government has the staying power because it's so concerned about China, and we haven't come to Russia yet, or the war in Ukraine, is that it doesn't have time for India. Oh, no. I, I, so I can't agree with that because I have a lot of conversations going on where I can see a lot of things happening in the U.S. government related to how you take the U.S.-India relationship to the next level. It's not my job to talk about it. Uh, you can talk to U.S. government people. But it is clear that there is a lot of continuing ambition for how we build 
together, the U.S.-India relationship. This has not been a one-sided affair for the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. It has been absolutely two wings of a bird flying higher and higher. And there are many positive ideas at play. And there's a positive trajectory and a positive vision. I think we're going to see great things. In fact, the best is definitely yet to come. So do you think that the U.S. and India have a common concern about China? Those are your words. I think the U.S. and India realize that they have common values and that those values are very important to defend and strengthen and uphold. Okay, so you're not uh, taking the China bait, but let me then bring you to, <laughs> let me ask you about Russia. Now, um, the, the war in Ukraine has, you know, roiled the world. Markets are in ferment. Uh, we are experiencing this on a daily basis in India and I imagine in the U.S. as well. How do you think India and the U.S., uh, and this is your former diplomat's hat I'd request you to put on. How do you think India and the U.S. should look at what's happening in Ukraine? Well, look, the whole world has been dealt with a very severe blow. <clears throat> if you think about it, we were all just trying to get out of the pandemic. We were just starting to see opening Absolutely. up of societies. And then we got whacked with not only the biggest war in Europe since World War II, mm -hmm. we also got whacked with 11 million innocent Ukrainians having to dislocate and flee for their lives. Right. Tons of people killed. Um, and now you have price shock in terms of fuel and food, and it's going to impact the poorest people on earth. But India has a different view from that. Please. No, the view is that, that the Russian invasion of Ukraine, India is refusing to criticize it, and, uh, and the Americans are clearly upset. But I'm talking about the impact. I'm, uh, you, that's your characterization. My sense is you're going to see food and fuel dislocation and impact and price rise as a result of the war for quite some time to come. Mm -hmm. Add to that the supply chain uh, dislocation caused by China COVID zero policies, and there is going to be a very tough economic impact on people all around the world, which is all the more reason why the engines of prosperity, America, India, Europe, Japan, Australia, work together in concert to power the world out of the pandemic and mitigate the impact of this war. The problem with that argument is, Ambassador Keshav, if you don't mind me saying, is that the US and China, Japan and China, Australia and China, not India's China as much, although India and China too, in fact, India-China trade went up during the pandemic and since then, as have all your countries. So the question is that you are so closely integrated with the Chinese, you're not going to be able to, to separate from them. You are Siamese twins for all practical purposes. Sorry, are we talking about Russia or China? No, right now, we're back to China. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll bring you back to Russia, don't you worry. <laughs> there is a recalibration all around the world about what it takes for societies to immunize themselves from shocks from outside. Uh, the supply chain shocks, the price rise shocks, the war shock. The, you know, do you remember back when we needed uh, personal protective equipment at the early days of the pandemic right. and we couldn't import those things? I was part of a team in the State Department that worked night and day to get workers into factories and factories moving so that the stuff could get to America for the medical uh, professionals. It was an enormous effort to make that happen. Things that usually go by ship were flown by air. Right. Uh, workers worked in factories for 30 days at a, at a go to make sure that the production was there. We're all learning lessons from that. We're all calibrating our policies to make sure we're not exposed to so those what's, kinds what's, of shocks. What's the lesson? What's the moral of the story? There are countries we can trust. And there are countries that share our values, and we should do more with them. But that's, you're talking about India as a country that you can trust. But right Absolutely. now you were talking about China and how you had to import personal protective equipment, PPEs, masks, face masks, etc. Because the, the, the COVID virus allegedly originated in a Chinese lab, or we don't know whatever that direct connection is. So what's the moral of that story? The moral of the story is we all have to be better prepared for the shocks in life. And look at India. Over $600 billion in foreign reserve, uh, reserves, uh, a booming export economy, uh, a government that is systematically 
um, unblocking the Indian economy to ensure its sheer potential. Uh, a government investing in people, in their health care, in their basic sanitation, their basic needs. A government that has spent a lot of time making sure that India can absorb the shocks of the current uncertainties. And a government that is creating the kinds of conditions where high trust companies and high trust societies can innovate together. That's pretty smart because it immunizes you against the next shock. And so an India more connected with the right kinds of countries and the right-minded countries is going to be an India that's very prosperous and will succeed very well. Okay, so you haven't answered the question about disengaging from China, nor the US, nor Japan, Australia. Obviously, you can't speak on behalf of, China, of Australia and Japan, but back to the Russia question. There's been a lot of criticism in the US about India's position on the Russian war in Ukraine. What do you make of that? India is a, so a sovereign country. It will make its own decisions. I can speak from the perspective of the American people, which is that we have always believed in um, the principles of the United Nations, of the UN Charter, the principle of, not, of um, one nation not aggressing, aggressively attacking another nation. Oh, India agrees with that. UN Charter yeah, absolutely. Yes. And it's not helpful to go back to an earlier mode of human relations where might makes right in terms of a, of a disagreement between states such that millions of people are displaced, thousands of people are killed, women and children are bombed in apartment but buildings. But you know that your former colleague, uh, the U.S. Deputy National uh, Security Advisor Dalip Singh, mm. had uh, you know, made a statement right here in New Delhi where he said that India would have to face serious consequences if it went ahead with uh, not criticizing you, uh, Russia and international fora. I mean, that was an unfortunate statement, wasn't it? No, I'm not sure Dalip said that, but the fact is he that did. our he used governments... Those words, serious consequences. Our governments are moving forward. You know, I don't speak for the U.S. government, but when you look at what happened in Tokyo with the Quad, with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, with all of the things that we're doing together, my feeling is that the momentum and the... Um, sort of direction of U.S.-India relations is very clear. No, We're both democracy. But what have, do you think people have moved on from the Leap Singh statement in the U.S.? I think people in the States recognize that India has compulsions, uh, that those compulsions necessitated a certain course of action. I think people in our government are very sophisticated and understand the full complexity of the range of motion in world affairs of various countries. And I also think, think, because I am a pensioner now. I think that our government fully understands how important it is to continue engaging India and to continue seeing India's rise in world affairs because it's good for democracy, it's good for America, it's good for the world. So these things will happen. In my career, we've seen ups and downs between the US and India. One thing I appreciate is we work together as friends, we work through problems, we discuss, we collaborate, and we embark upon an ambitious future course. And where does the USIBC come into this? We're votaries of the relationship. Our companies are creating millions of jobs in both countries. We are innovating and designing in both countries. We are ensuring the future happiness and prosperity of all of the people of America and India. And I think that we are, again, the catalyst of a quicker achievement by India of its own goals of becoming a 10 or 20 or 30 trillion dollar economy. I think India has that capability. I think America wants to be part of that success story, and what's good for India is good for America and vice versa. So USIBC's job is to try to smooth the path, lower the, the obstacles, and see both of our people prosper. On this note, Ambassador Atul Keshap, thank you so much for your time, <laughs> for speaking to me at the print. And as someone of Indian origin, thank you for for giving us this big picture view of the world as you see it. Thank you again. Thank you, Jyoti Ji.